Hi there, I'm Ron Wright. I teach criminal law and criminal procedure classes at Wake Forest University. Today we're going to be talking about some of the constitutional rules that prevent the police from using physical coercion, like torture, uh, or other forms of coercion when they're uh, interrogating a suspect, when they're questioning a suspect who is in custody. Uh, the case that really got all of this started and made it into a constitutional issue is called Brown versus Mississippi from 1936. So we'll be talking about Brown and then the, uh, the cases that flow from Brown versus Mississippi. So let's go in and talk. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're going to be talking today about interrogations, those times when the police have arrested somebody, the person is in custody, probably at the station house, probably located in a uh, interrogation room somewhere, uh, and they're being questioned. Uh, and here's an amazing thing. If you were to look at this practice in 1931, there was an awful lot of physical violence that is going on in the interrogation room. Not, you know, just once every, you know, one in a million cases, but as a routine matter, physical violence, you could call it torture, was being used against defendants who were being uh, questioned by the police. So we've got this horrifying picture in 1930. We know something about this because of a famous report that was put together uh, starting in 1929, uh, published in 1931, this effort. Uh, it was connected with prohibition, the, uh, the uh, prohibition of liquor in the United States, and it was not going well. There, was, there were all kinds of law enforcement troubles that were coming from trying to enforce the prohibition laws. And so the president uh, asked, uh, President Hoover asked uh, George Wickersham, to head uh, a commission that would look into law enforcement. George Wickersham was the former Attorney General of the United States and was sort of the establishment New York lawyer, uh, part of the, uh, the New York firm of Cadwallader, Cadwallader Wickersham and Taft. Uh, Taft was the former President Taft, who is now a lawyer in uh, New York. Uh, and so uh, Wickersham puts together this big research group, hires staff, they spread out all over the country and go and ask people how they do things in criminal justice. They pour through the records in the criminal courts. They also go and talk to police officers and to reporters locally and they try to get a picture for how cases are being investigated. And they write up their, uh, their uh, conclusions in this report that said, and it says, Physical coercion is a normal part of policing. It is just a normal part of what happens when a suspect is interrogated. Not in every case, but regularly. Just a normal part of the process. And in some cases, leading to serious long-term uh, injuries. Think about that moment then. Freeze the action there, 1931. We go later, 1967. Not all that much long, not all, all that much later, you know, three and a half, 36 years later. 36 years later, the President's Commission uh, on, uh, on Crime goes out and does much the same kind of thing. Finds out what's going on in the field. Uh, they're putting together a big taking stock kind of report. And they come back and say that the third degree, that is the use of, of physical force during interrogation, is largely gone. You, there might be an occasional exceptional case. We've heard a rumor about one case here and one case there. But as a regular feature of interrogation, physical force disappeared by 1967. An amazing and I would say wonderful turn of events. Uh, and how did it happen? That's a question for us. What role did the law play in this happening? Well, the law probably had something to do with it because we do have uh, an important legal milestone in 1936, Brown versus Mississippi. In this case, we have three suspects, three uh, African Americans in Mississippi who are accused of the murder of a, uh, of a farm owner, a planter, um, and his name was Raymond Stewart. And these three uh, suspects are arrested, Ed Brown, Henry Shield, and Yank Ellington. And they are 
there's really no other way to put it. They are tortured. They are beaten with, uh, with a belt with metal uh, uh, accessories on it. They are hung from the neck, not so, much, not so much as to kill them, but hung from the neck. Think about the powerful symbolic imagery of that in a world where lynchings were just a regular part of the landscape. Uh, whippings. Um, ultimately, they confess. Well, we know a lot about, what hap about the quality of what happens after torture, and so there's all kinds of reasons to wonder about the accuracy of a uh, confession obtained in this way. But the claim is, you, you know, once the criminal charges are brought for murder, once Ed Brown is charged with murdering this case, he says in the state courts, you can't use this evidence. A, it's, highly, it's just false. I just confess to make them stop. But B, you can't use evidence that was obtained through torture. That's just not what a court system will do if it respects the rule of law. The Mississippi Supreme Court disagreed and said we, could, we can use this, although we're not crazy about the way it was obtained, but we'll ask a, you know, a more detailed set of questions about whether we believe the accuracy of the statements. But ultimately, after his conviction was, uh, was affirmed in the Mississippi Supreme Court, Ed Brown appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court says unequivocally, you can't do this. As a matter of federal due process, a state court cannot use evidence that is obtained through physical torture, as it, was, as it happened here, uh, and uh, we will remand and ask you to, you know, you're going to have to do something uh, in these proceedings, possibly dismiss, but you can't go forward on the basis of evidence obtained through, uh, through torture. So we might ask, Remember this change in practice that became national between 1931 and 1967. Did Brown versus Mississippi explain this change? Is it because of Brown, the prohibition on the use of torture, that, uh, that finally the police had no incentive to use it because they couldn't use the, uh, the evidence? That's probably part of it, but as with all things legal, the law probably interacts with other uh, uh, complementary sources. So some of it was that, uh, that the public was starting to get very uneasy about the use of what's called the third degree, uh, both in Mississippi and in lots of other places. It became a subject for pretty sensational newspaper articles when reporters would find out about particular cases. They could sell a lot of newspapers uh, when they could describe a case when torture happened. Uh, and so there was a lot of, uh, of press pressure and public outcry about this uh, practice. Police officers were also at this point becoming part of professional organizations and the idea of policing as a profession was really taking hold and so that was sort of driving out practices like, uh, like uh, torture. Um, and then the idea may be that crime rates changed and that took some of the pressure off of the police. So very high crime rates in the 1930s but much lower crime rates in the 1940s and 1950s, and that may have created some breathing space for these new judicial doctrines to really take hold and to move police practices. But at any rate, we have uh, some real changes in the practices of police over this time. Today, this doctrine still matters. There is still a due process requirement that says the police cannot use uh, a coerced confession, and one of the easiest ways to prove that a coerced confession was coerced is if you can show there was some kind of physical force used, like you know some kind of torture. Um, it also applies to physical deprivations, like if you don't let the person, if you don't let your suspect sleep, or don't let them eat, if you you know if you extend their, the uh, interrogation session for too long so that it becomes uh, physically uh, overwhelming uh, or even psychologically overly coercive after multiple hours in the, in the interrogation room, then again you might have some kind of ruling from the courts that the, co that the confession was not voluntary, it was coerced, and therefore the courts can't use it. So physical abuse and physical deprivation are now grounds for uh, excluding confessions from uh, evidence in criminal courts. The same line of reasoning has been exported into some related areas. So there are 
Uh, there are settings where police officers, the questioners, will make threats and promises. And there are some threats and promises that become too coercive and form the basis for excluding, for throwing out the confession. So for instance, a, a threat to say, if you don't cooperate with me, we're going to file additional charges on top of the ones that are already there. That kind of threat probably puts the confession at risk. Or if you make promises like, if you cooperate with us, then we'll drop all the other charges. Or if you cooperate with us, we will not charge your spouse or your children or something along those lines. So those kinds of threats or promises can lead to a finding of coercion. You do have to show the causal link. You have to show that the person is confessing because of that coercive thing, that threat or promise that you made uh, during the interaction, during the interrogation. So if the threat or promise happens very early on and it's hours later or days later that the confession happens, maybe there's not a causal link, but uh, if, the, uh, if the defendant can prove there's a causal link between an improper threat or an improper promise uh, on the one hand and a confession on the other, then it gets thrown out. There are other threats and promises that uh, are, w w you know, are acceptable, uh, something less coercive than the, uh, uh, than the uh, filing of extra charges or the dismissal of, of additional counts in the, in the criminal case. Uh, but the general question here is, does the threat or promise tend to produce uh, the sort of coercion that would lead to false confessions? Uh, there's also a, um, uh, a set of cases that deal with police lies. What if they lie to the suspect and tell them something factually false? And again, the question is, is it the kind of lie that normally tends to, uh, to produce uh, false confessions? Uh, I would say most of the case law here allows for lies. There is no flat out ban on lies during interrogation. But again, they're asking about the coercive effects of certain kinds of lies over uh, others. So if there are lies about the nature of the crime scene, oh, we found your fingerprint on the car door, or you forgot and you left your, you know, you dropped your, uh, you know, a personal item out of your backpack at the scene of the crime, or your co-defendant is talking right now, even though, none of the, even though all of those might be lies, they relate to the alleged crime or the investigation, and those tend not to be thought of as coercive lies. On the other hand, uh, lies uh, along the lines of what the legal, relevant legal principles are. You know, are we going to have to prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt? Or what, if you're lying about what the law requires the prosecution to prove, that's an example of a coercive uh, lie. Uh, or if you're lying about charges, being brought against family members, for instance, uh, that spills over into that idea of threats or promises that become too coercive. So uh, we're talking about a collection of, of uh, situations here, the physical uh, abuse, the physical deprivation, the threats and promises that become coercive, and lies, at least of the sort that don't relate to the crime itself or the investigation, uh, but the sort of lies that might produce coercion and uh, and false confessions. So that's the whole collection of areas where this uh, confession law has, has uh, developed and remains true uh, uh, today. For next time, we're going to talk about an overlay on top of this whole body of law about coercion. And it's re it relates to the Miranda Doctrine that tells police officers about certain warnings that they have to give affirmatively before they can carry out an interrogation of a suspect. So we'll talk about those Miranda warnings uh, when we get together next. See you then.